<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're still uh, awake. And unfortunately, the, the previous special guest gave me a hard time, so the, try to imagine how hard would be give a nice talk after him. But I try to do my best. Uh, uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, my role, what I'm doing at Prezi, and about the road uh, uh, on VR at the moment. So what I can tell you in advance that there is no happy ending at the time. So most probably you've been in the situation that you cannot get any worse after a certain point. Yes, you can. So we were up, down, up, down, and we are a little bit down with, with our processes and ideas, but we are going to come back. And I hope you are going to enjoy this uh, session. If you have any questions, just stop me. Then we can talk about it. And I try to save five minutes after, uh, after I'm finished for, for, for the questions, if you have any more, if you uh, don't have the, or don't want to ask me, you can find on any of these locations, uh, either on, on Twitter or email. And it seems I'm more responsive on uh, my social account than on my company account. So right here, if you would like to ask anything. So before uh, jumping in, uh, I've, okay, I'm involved in the Kanban movement, but I'm not really a, a Kanban guy like the others. I like other ideas as well. And nowadays, I try to approach Agile and then Kanban from, a, from the philosophical perspective, not like Socrates uh, sitting on the street and making fun of others, but philosophy in the term and how to think about what we are doing. So the first part of any journey or any approach is what's your motive? What's the question you are asking? How do you know when you are on the right path? And I would say, fortunately, a, a British police officer helped me with this one because he gave an interview a while back on TV and uh, he was talking about uh, fighting crime. And he said the, the job of the police in, in Britain or in the world is not fighting crime, but it's preventing crime. So actually what they are in is a very bad situation that they're focusing on them fighting all the time, but actually they can gain more with preventing. And if you think about your work, either you are doing a child or anything else, just are you fighting with something or are you preventing something from happening? And if you think about the core practices or the ideas in the agile movement, like test event development is not for fighting with code, it's for preventing reoccurring bugs or having better design later or you have a retrospective meeting to prevent a bad behavior later in time. So actually, this question helps me a lot when I'm in a situation that I am doing the right thing now. So if I'm fighting, I'm not doing the right thing. But if I'm preventing something, that's a completely different deal. Okay, so let me talk a bit more about uh, the steam structure. At the moment, I'm a project manager. I'm saying at the moment, because we are changing the process organizational structure, everything so fast that it could happen that at the end of this week, I'm going to have a different title, but at the same company, but doing something differently or for a different approach. And what you can see here is a, is a setup from December in a recent uh, Prezi project where we are doing a, a mobile uh, na native application and web development, and these are the teams involved. So we had the 10 teams in, in one project just uh, for, for a setup. And one team is quite, a team is quite small. So we don't have a team for one person. So most of our teams are for two or three. Now we have four guys in a team. So actually the whole structure is about 40 people and, uh, and it's quite big. So it's the biggest thing presented in the last couple of uh, years regarding structure and the process. And these teams are very autonomous. They do whatever they feel like to do. And that means it's not easy to coach them or work with them, but they are, they are very responsive. So if you have a good idea and you can sell it to them, then it's going to happen. But just telling them what to do, it won't work. And what you can see here is a Kanban board from uh, Linkit Kanban. And if you follow David's talk, there is no VIP limit on none of the boards. So actually it's not a real Kanban system or not a, they are not following Kanban. They are just using for dust management, but they are not working on too many things at the same time, so it's not a big problem. So they can uh, use the system as they want. Okay. So the first thing we, we faced is uh, 
we need a completely different approach to software development because we have a competition and we would like to get to a market faster, we would like to have better products and we would like to gain more market share. And uh, we cannot really do with the current setup. So our architecture on the back-end side scales very nicely, but on the client side it's, it doesn't, it's not true. And it's also problematic thing to, to scale the whole organization. So we, there we had 10 teams and uh, the question is what shall we do if we want to include another 10 teams? So it's, it's impossible in the current setup. So we started to look around and then find other alternatives outside of the Agile and the, the combo movement and see what others are doing to stay focused and have a scalable organization and, uh, and architecture. And we found this 4DX. It's called the Four Disciplines of Execution. That's a very nice name. You don't have to remember any of these sessions. But it says that you need to pick one item from your daily work, one single item, and focus only that item and try to solve it. It's called a widely important goal. And if you succeed with this approach, you solved one problem at a time. So you know, do you know the saying that how you eat an elephant? It's one piece at, at a time. Of course, it will take a lot of time to eat a whole elephant. But what this says, that find a big goal you would like to change. Whether it's uh, you would like to change the color of the walls, you would like to change how the teams are structured, you would like to change how the product looks like, and focus only this thing. You can do the rest of the work you are doing during the day, but keep in mind that you are determined and committed to fix this only thing. So if you go back from this conference and you say, I'm going to change uh, the, the thinking of uh, one of my colleagues, only single one of them, you are focusing only on that guy or the, that woman and doing that. And what this uh, model suggests to use different measures than before. So what you can actually measure now or you observe now is the past. Okay, again, there's some, some philosophy. So because let's say if I want to go to that part of this room and I know that I'm going to do a couple of steps. I know that I made one, two, three, but this happened before I actually made it. And when you measure anything in, uh, in, uh, in your daily work or at home, this, uh, you cannot really do anything with this measurement. So that room will be always uh, 50 meters uh, away. So you cannot really measure how far uh, this gets because that's always there. But uh, this is a lag measure meaning that it's, it's going to happen, but you can see the tendency how it changes. I will talk about it. But you can have a lead measure. A lead measure that you can actually do something to indicate change. So if you see these uh, rotating things, so if you do something with the lead measure, it will affect the, the wig, the goal, and how to see it in, in the life. So if I'm decided to getting there, my Log uh, my lead measure is that left, right, left, right. That one I can control. And eventually I will going to get there. And what you see is the log measure, how far I get from here to there. But I'm going to talk about it uh, later. So actually we use this method to, to drive the change through the whole uh, uh, organization. And here's another snippet from, uh, from there. It says, here are the lead measures. You check it, see it, and how they change uh, the lead, the log, and the rig measures. Okay. And what we did is, let's uh, change the way we do our daily life based on this idea. So most probably you have to fill out reports where you describe what you have done and what your plans are. And we said, okay, we still have these reports, but let's use it in our advantage. So what you can see here is two diagrams for a particular team showing these measures. And uh, the, tech, the, leader of, the leaders of the team were asked to fill this out with the intention that if you want to have a good report, what do you have to do? You have to think ahead. What are you going to do next? Or how this whole looks like? What are the, the next steps? And you have to look back what you did. So to have a great report, we have the uh, team leads to use this technique. Look back, think about what your team did, and think about what you are going to do. So if you remember the philosophy from the beginning, 
So you cannot really prevent something if you don't know that's going to happen. So with, uh, with this approach, we worked with the team leads to see the problems in the future. Because if you know that that's going to be an issue later, now the time to fix it. If we let it happen, then we have to go and fight uh, with the situation and we'll take all of our energy. So what's here is stating what their goal was and what they did to achieve that goal, how the measurements uh, look like and what are the next plans. And if you read this diagram, you can see how this team uh, uh, was uh, progressing. So the blue says uh, the work items they committed to do. And the red is uh, the actually number of delivered work items in a week. So you can see here that they delivered more, and they, but there was a point when they started committing to more work items, and more and more, and they needed about three weeks to get rid of this habit. But these uh, graphs or this chart helped me and my colleagues to figure out that, okay, we have a team, which, uh, which team has a problem. So at uh, week 48, we just see this one. So just looking at this report and not reading all the other stuff, it helped us narrowing down that, okay, there is a situation and we need to start fixing it. So again, it's about uh, predictability and uh, what we wanted to do is act faster. Because if we are not really fast, you can add it up and we can be in a trouble later on. And when the report was filled out, we gathered everybody in a, in a room like this. We have a, a conference room and each team uh, had to present what they did in the last week. So it was like a demo in, in Scrum or an operations review in the Kanban method. And here are different bubbles and they had a demo, sometimes a video, sometimes a manual demonstration, where they showed everybody else what they did. And they shared their plans uh, with the rest of the organization so that we know that if, let's say, this team plans to remove something, the leader will talk about it. And if this team plans to use that something, we will know immediately at the meeting. So it was a very powerful thing, uh, what we did uh, with this approach. And uh, this is how it looks uh, closer, the demo. And in the end, we asked the, the teams, OK, tell us whether you are on track and how confident are you that you are going to deliver later. Again, with, with this thinking. So we never told them that you must be on track but you must be confident, but how confident you are that it's going to happen. And just looking at these dots, you can see they are on, not on track, but they are very confident that they are going to be. And this can raise uh, some questions. And just looking at these four teams, which one needs the more attention? Is it easy to pick? Yes. So first this one, and then this one. They, they have the same things, but the lower you were on the graph, the deeper you were in the architecture. So just with an easy bleak, without being at the meeting, you can make a very good guess and narrowing down what, what your next step is. And imagine you have to work with 10 teams and you have to interview all of them instead of looking at something like this and then you can go right ahead and check out what's going on there. And at and, and the end of each session, we check the overall project. So it's not enough to know how you are doing. If you want to be real transparent, you have to see how the others are doing and all together. And it was a global plan, what we intended to do. And uh, we examined uh, some Kanban boards because we, have a, we had a huge portfolio Kanban board. So it doesn't look like the board David showed you yesterday, if you remember it, because it's a portfolio board. What does it mean? Each lane belonged to a certain team and what they had to do. And uh, if you, you haven't seen this before, which team is uh, doing fine in this, uh, in this project at this given time? Is it the first one? So it's the second one. So they managed to do uh, a lot of stuff in the same amount of time the other teams had. And if you need to find a team that requires your help, which team is it? Your help. So let's say you are a project manager and you want to help your organization to get better, which team requires your attention? Yes. Yeah, 
And uh, if you remember the philosophy was I said in the beginning, so now we won't let teams to fall, but right now we can have a guess where we, can, where we have to do some change. So we are not fighting with each other, so we are trying to prevent in this fall happening instead of, okay, now you failed and let's uh, figure out what to do next. That's also a good approach, but, but it's easier if you know some stuff uh, in advance. So it was, it was the time when we realized that we should uh, do things completely differently. So when, when we saw this, it said, okay, things are kind of fine, but when we actually looked at the demos, they weren't fine. So that was a down point, and after that came the real agile movement uh, for us in, in this project. So the first thing we realized is that it won't work if we have 10 teams and one project or two project managers for, for these teams. So we did an experiment whether Prezi could use some project management, and after two months we concluded that it's, it won't work. Because the accountability and the responsibility is at the wrong place. You have to move it down, those who can actually do something about it. So if I'm, let's say, uh, responsible for the delivery, what, what's, what the thing, what's the only thing I can do to make it happen? I go to the developers and poke them or kick them to make the delivery. But if I move the responsibility down that, okay, you are responsible for your own delivery and I'm here to help you with your issues, that's a completely different deal. Because then I'm, I can focus on my work and he can focus on his work. The only thing, mm, like a contract between us, that when he, there is a trouble, I should know, or and the other should know. That was uh, one thing we realized. Second, we cannot scale this. So we wanted to, to scale the architecture, uh, the process and the organization, and that's not the right tool for it. Because we, cannot, we can add more lines, but it won't help us figuring out more about the next steps. So we did a completely different approach and uh, that's actually the present, until now I was talking about the past, we, we started to use this uh, scheduled portfolio Kanban. What does it mean? That instead of looking at the project team by team, we are looking at as a whole, and what uh, the teams were asked to do, give a guess when you are going to finish a certain item. If you miss it, it's no problem, but put it into the column where you think that's going to be done. So here we have some item, and they said it's going to be done end of the eighth, eighth week. It was this February. So actually I just uh, removed the titles, but the dates are real. So it happened at the beginning of this year. And if you look at this, and let's say this is week six, you can see where the troubles are. So if it's week six, we have this whole lot of work uh, is still, uh, let's say, in the backlog. We still have to sort it out. And the most problematic team is the one in, in brown. And these are in, in brown, you cannot really see it. Because they have a very low progression state. Here we have zero out of five, one out of five, and one out of seven. And they still have work in the other columns. And it goes back to what uh, we checked with the other board. Just by looking at it, we can narrow it down where to focus. Or I can narrow it down and see, okay, now we need to focus on this team and let the others do in their work. So doing several things in parallel, it won't work, and most probably, well not most probably, you know this, it's not working. And you can also see which teams are fine, which means if they are doing fine and they can help with the other stuff, we can move them there. But uh, it never happened, but we had the possibility. And what, uh, as you can see, there are these small bumps, the black things, they are small bumps, and these are dependencies between teams. Unfortunately, the tool doesn't allow us to show dependencies in a proper way, but the idea here, if all the bombs are in the same column, then we have a problem. Because then we have two teams depending on each other delivering at the same date, which means they are go there is going to be a shift in the schedule, no matter what they do. And when they get too closer, we have to act. Okay? Does it make sense to you? Yes? Uh, it's a, it's a high level, you can think about it's an epic, if you know the epic from the scrum term. It's a larger feature, the larger work item, and the numbers mean that the team took this item 
and broke, broke down to smaller items on their board. But on the project level, I, I have no interest in the work items what they have. I interest in the features we started to do. So it's like uh, having a button on the interface. So I don't care whether they need uh, what backend job, what services they need. I need to see when that button is on the board. And what we did with this, nobody was allowed to move the items from the weeks to the done, unless it was tested. So I, I checked uh, each of them. Okay, now it's working. It is uh, how it looks like, and it could get to done. So it was a pretty easy, and it's still a pretty easy system to use. And what we were missing, and I missed for a lot in HR project, was risk management. Have you ever heard about risk management in an HR project? And I think it's a very important thing. Uh, <coughs> so it's a board of a completely different team. And I'm having this board just to show the origin. So this was a service-oriented team. Uh, and uh, the problem was they couldn't really figure out what to do next. So we came up with this priority list. And you can see it better here. And how to read this board. You can see these uh, charts at the beginning. So the first one is, has a narrow line. Means that you have something happened that had an immediate impact. So what you can see here, the time is on the x and the impact is on the y axis. So it has an immediate impact. Uh, for example, when all the services are down, that's an imme immediate impact because that affects our business and ha we have to do something about it. <coughs> for example, uh, somebody got sick and he's the only person who knows how to fix the system and he's not there. That's a risk, that's an immediate risk. It, it goes to the first row. Okay? Second row says, at this moment in time, we know that something is going to happen in the future, and the later we deal with it, the bigger the impact will be. So if I know now that my train is uh, going to leave at 6 o'clock, and I'm staying here still 5, the more I wait, so it's 5.10, 5 5.20, 5 the more I wait, the higher the risk that I'm going to miss my, my train. Uh, for example, that we know that our system cannot handle more than uh, 100 million uh, customers. But the prediction says in half a year we are going to have 200 million. Just, uh, I'm just coming up with numbers. So this is a risk we should handle, but it's not something that we have to take right now. But the later we take care of it, the bigger the problem will be. So these risks go to the second row. Third row is a bit different. Then we have some time doing practically nothing. And then it turns to the level two going upwards. And that's the risk board we are using. And uh, we are using it now. And what we do is check this every day and see the, how the risks move on this board. So what you can see here, that we had, had something become more serious, meaning that the time has passed, we didn't do something about it, that level three became level two, or something on level one got, got sorted out, but you can finish something on the other levels. And again, just by looking at this board, you can have uh, an instant idea of what's your next step what you have to do. And the agreement with the teams that they put the risks on the board and in cooperation with engineering management, they will discuss the levels and the natures and what is the next step. So you don't have to solve every problem immediately. You have to solve the most important problem. Okay. And we introduced another board. Okay, we like uh, boards where we, what we call big picture. And the point of the big picture is to see when we can actually have a product on a certain platform. So what you see on the uh, schedule portfolio Kanban, how do items move regarding time? But it's really hard to figure out whether we are going to have a, uh, an iOS application or how, how, how the iOS development looks like. And that's the purpose of this uh, big picture board. So if you see, uh, I think that was the iOS line, that we have items all over here, and only a few here, meaning that that project is in, uh, or that uh, product is in trouble. Again, with visualization, and then with tracking. And it's not for me as a project manager, or not for my boss, who is an engineering manager. Okay, we have too many managers, but for everybody else. And there, were, there is a story that there was uh, one colleague who really liked uh, mobile development, 
and when he joined the company, he, the only thing he's going to do is mobile development. And uh, for some reason, we had some issues with, uh, with our website, the JavaScript, and this guy was the first one who stand up and said, okay, I want to work there, although I don't like it, because that's going to change uh, our life. And he saw not, okay, he had discussions with other colleagues, but he could realize that he can do a better work at a place he doesn't like than at a place he likes. So if you have colleagues like this, try to keep them. Yeah. And this is how everything connects. So when we have a new feature, it goes to the big picture. It's easy. Then it broke down to the schedule, so we can see how it looks like regarding time and action. If you have some risks, you go to the risk board, and teams have their own boards. And if you move something here, we have some automation uh, in the system. We'll change here and we'll change there. So we actually don't have to do too much to, to keep the system updated. And from, uh, from the regular developer to a team lead to uh, any manager, they can find their own board and get an immediate idea of what's going on in the project. And I could go on for, for hours how good is this uh, for everybody, but I think you can imagine this. Most probably you have something similar or you will have in the future. Okay. Any questions about this setup and about the purpose of this setup? Yes, please. I'm just going to take a hint from the risk uh, board to the uh, web server team board. Yeah. Yeah, there's some risk to the risk connections. So yeah. To so they have the same color. We are using colors for different teams. And if you put it here and when we review it, let's say they see they found something risky here. You can put the notes of the cards in the description so you can write it. And actually, these connections are less automatic than the others, but it gets there. And just by clicking on, uh, on these notes, you can go here and here and see where the problem really is. Uh, I, does this answer your question? Okay. Uh, but uh, Personally, I f prefer the discussion personally with the guys. So when I see something strange, I just go there. And unfortunately, they come to me as well, so I'm interrupted all the time. But uh, that's why I'm there to, to figure this out. So the point is, if, not the point. So what, we, what I would like to achieve and we would like to achieve with, with this team, that if they see a cer just a tiny bit of thing that's going to turn bad, we, we should know about it in advance. So we cannot really afford making uh, these small issues like large issues and stuff like that. If you know that something is going to uh, happen, then put it there. If it won't happen, we move it to level four and then we drop it out if it doesn't happen. But if you know that something is going to happen, uh, we need to know and you need to know. So there is this, this teaching and mentoring. So first, all, all together we need to know, but it's actually making your life easier if you know that something is going to happen. And I would say it's not easy. So our, our leads are very good with technology, but they find this part very hard. And what Rachel Davis was talking about before, it's not something that's going to happen from, from day one to day 10. So my expectation to have at least three leads who is very good with risk management is four months. So first they have to fall off very big so that they can see the consequences and then we can teach and uh, uh, see how we move forward. I put it up the 4 dx again, because most, if you check the transcript of this session so far, I haven't said ret about retrospectives anything. And the reason is we didn't really do retrospectives. We were discussing issues uh, uh, when, when, they, when they came into light, but no ret retrospectives. And why we, I put it back, second reason, to have it for retrospectives, and we are doing this wrong. So we, we needed three months to figure out that we applied this technique, but we failed at it. So we used it for, actually for project management, but this tool is not for project management. This tool helps you to focus on a thing that you want to solve. So I give you an example, of my favorite example. So a widely important goal for a soccer player is not to play soccer because that's why he went to the team, and that's why he trained all the time. But we use this technique, uh, there are teams still with a widely important goal that we have to deliver this, uh, this package at this date. But that's why they come to work every day. So that's not really a goal, that's a purpose, what they are doing. 
and there's a fine difference. And back to the uh, soccer or the football metaphor, that scoring, uh, increasing the, rate, the goal rates from corner kicks, that's a goal, uh, the widely important goal. Because you can train it, you can see, you can practice it, and you can check the result. So actually the practice is the lead measure, how much you practice a corner kicks, and the log measure is how many goals you scored from a corner kick. And we are still not doing this properly, I can tell you, but the plan is that we reintroduce retrospectives, and the teams will be asked to find one thing they would improve in every second week and follow it through with the, with the different measures. And why it's important to use the measures? Because if you remember, the log shows how good you are with this and the lead shows what you did to make it happen. So let's say if a team doesn't do anything to make it happen and it, it's, it's not changing, then that's fine. But if they don't do anything and it's changing, that the problem was somewhere else. Again, just by looking at this information, and creating this information, we make people think that will make me think because I have to do the same for the whole project or whatever we are going to have and think what, what I did, what we did and what's going to be the next step. And not just rushing it and then coding it and see what's going to happen. And uh, for the predictability, it's, it's possible to gather data for many Kanban board. So if you are familiar with the method, there are these histograms. And what does it tell you? So the lead time distribution says you are working on certain work items. And there are, let's say, five occasions when you finished in 16 days. And there are uh, about 15 when you finish something in two days, right? Is it uh, understandable what the top left diagram is telling you? So here's the question. Uh, let's take it out of the context for a bit of it. I'm your customer and you have this chart and I give you a similar job and you have to give me, let's say, an estimate when you are going to deliver this item, what, which day would you tell me? So are you going to tell me you are going to have it in two days? I guess it's a no. So the question is, uh, I give you, an, uh, let's say, an assignment. You did it uh, several times before. And you have to tell me when I can have it or when you are going to be finished with this. And you have this data available. What would you like, what will you tell me? I would say it's 12. Or 16. No, not. Oh, I would say uh, 13. And, and here is the, the logic behind this. So the history tells me and tells you that in the past, a very, a very similar exercise took longer than two days. So if you commit or give me two days, there is a very high chance that you are going to be late. And it's not about uh, playing safe. Uh, the, the recommendation is pick it at the date at the 85% here. So that's why I said it's uh, probably it's, uh, it's uh, for uh, 13. And it's a very easy thing. You can gather it from any charts or I usually collect them on paper and put it into a CSV file and generate these charts with a Ruby script. But this is very helpful to see. It's what Vasco was talking about uh, yesterday. So it's not estimating what's going to happen. You just find similarities and then give a date based on your history. Of course, you are going to get better. You have to regenerate the chart all the time, but it's fine. And what you can see here, the same histogram, how the work in progress changed for a team on a portfolio level. And how, the, how is this helpful to anybody? Let's say it's for a team and this team says they are going to be done with 10 items in uh, 20 days. Okay. 10 items in 20 days. Are they going to be successful based on this? No. So the best they can do is uh, working on four items at the same time, but they are very good when they are working on two. So they have 10 items. Most probably these 10 items would, uh, so you cut the 10 into half, that's five. 
you multiply the 5 with uh, 13, and uh, that's about uh, 65. So they are going to be ready in 65 days, and that's not 20. And with this technique, you can easily find the issues, like what I said with the predictability and the things. So if they commit to that one, they will struggle to solve it. Most probably they will reach their goal, but what they are going to do, they cut corners, reduce quality, uh, do some stuff. But if they have this data and I have this data, we can, well, we can prevent this from happening. And this is what I mean when I'm talking about predictability. So it's not uh, figuring out what's going to be a next step, but based on our history, what's going to be the next step. And uh, moving this idea on a team level, this is something I used with a different company. The, uh, we, we worked together for, for a year. So I'm not a consultant, but this was my previous job. And with this team, uh, we wanted uh, to have a fully predictable system. So we are very ambitious, and we wanted to know if we are going to be ready, let's say, in, a, in one day or two days. So we had a different board. And what you can see here is actually cards that we are working on. So we put our previous work items into three columns, small, medium, large, very easy structure. Based uh, on how complex, how similar these works are. So some of them are uh, website development, some of them are backend, but we are checking, are these somehow similar? And we put the similar items in each individual column and we measured the, the lead time and the spend time on these items. So when our uh, product owner came to us and gave us a new work item, we went to this for like this. Is it similar to these? No. Is it similar to these? Yes. What's the current date? It's nine. So we are going to be ready with this in nine days. And this is how we planned our work at that time. We don't do this uh, technique at Prezi, but uh, I would like uh, to coach people and the teams to start using it. And what you can see here, there's an S, an arrow M, meaning that this item was an S, but when we were finished with it, it was an M. So we, we screwed up something, which means when we are going to have a similar item in the future, we should be very careful, we say, whether it's an S and whether it's an M. And it's a very easy thing to figure it out. And we practiced it for, for three months. And we were able to give delivery dates to a two-hour precision. So we needed three months, but it, it's possible to do it. But the only thing you need is determination that you want to do it and you can do it. And there were no estimates in this idea. We just used what we did uh, before. Does it make sense? Do you see that's possible where you work? to have something like this. Okay. Then I won't tell you to implement it, I'm just hoping that actually you can start uh, doing something like this. Okay, and about the future, I think the risk board still uh, can be improved and evolved, like uh, with the timing. So how much time do we need to react to solve a certain risk. So if we can improve the whole organization to react faster, then our life is going to be better. Again, this, uh, this is a theory. We are not there yet. We are just building up the, the risk work and uh, trying to use it properly. But later on, the goal will be to react faster to, to these issues. Yeah, so that was it. And uh, Checking my notes, I still want to share some, some things with you, like a takeaway, stuff that you can think about. So there are two approaches uh, to, to do good. You can change good with anything else. So well, the first idea is if you are doing good things, most probably good things are going to happen to you. But that's not very likely. But if you decide, that you want to do one good thing, you have more possibilities to go to that direction. And I'm telling you this because uh, somebody asked me what makes a good uh, product manager. And I told this guy that the difference be in, in this thinking, because there is a, if there is a product manager who says, if we are continuing doing these features, eventually the whole product is going to be better. But there is a risk 
So there is a level two risk immediately in, in this session. But if we have a product manager who says, okay, I want to do that one because I know that if we implement that idea, our product is going to be better and we figure out how we get there, that's a completely different thing. And uh, thanks. And you can guess which product uh, manager, product owner you would like to work with or how you approach uh, situations. But I rec what I'm asking you is not to decide, just to think about this. So whether it's better to do some stuff and then finally hoping that something is going to happen or you decide that you want to do something and you figure out how to get there. And uh, that was it. Thank you very much for for staying and uh, choosing this track. I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate that you were here. And